Day 104 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Happy Sunday, friends. If you are studying with us in real time, welcome back to Bible Study if you're part of the Heart Dive fam. And if you're new to this Bible Study, we welcome you, letting you know that we do have lots of videos. We have been studying the Bible from the first page from Genesis. We actually started in January 2023, started over again in 2024. So lots of videos for you to go back and deep dive into God's Word. Today we are in 1 Samuel chapters 21 through 24, reading from the ESV by Crossway Translation. But before we get started, a big thank you to Holly once again for allowing me to have a day of rest. I tell you what, it's a game changer when she comes in and relieves me because even when I wasn't filming on Saturday, I was already Already thinking about, oh, I got to film two videos tomorrow. So thank you, Holly. Again, I have not had a chance to go and watch her video. I heard she did an amazing job. People saying they're already seeing growth in her. And I think that that is incredible. I can't wait to come home from church today and just sit back, relax and study with her. But we're going to go ahead and pray and jump into the word here today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us with life again today, with breath in our lungs, with the ability to wake up and choose joy and to choose you. And that is exactly exactly what we're doing as we have set aside time today to just be able to be in your presence. And so I pray that as we do draw near to you, Lord, will you draw near to us? I pray that you please wipe away anything out of our heart that does not need to be there, that shouldn't be there, any of the grime, Lord, that is holding us back from being able to hear you clearly and to be able to see you clearly. Sometimes we will look through a really blurry lens, and that is just because of our own insecurities or guilt or anything else that might be hanging over our head. So I pray that you will take that away. Show us, Lord, if there's anything that we don't even understand why we might not be able to hear or see you. Please forgive us of our sins. I pray that you'll help us forgive others. But as we open up your word today, the daily manna, the logos or the logos, I pray that your Holy Spirit will bring revelation today, the rhema, that it won't just be words on a page, but they will be a divine message that is able to sink down deep into our spirits. Thank you for this family, Lord. Every single person that is here, we know that you have appointed this time for us to be able to be together in your word. We love you so much. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So we left off in chapter 20, where Saul's son, Jonathan, warns David that Saul is indeed out to get him. And so he sends him off on his way. So we pick up here in chapter 21. Then David came to Nob. So Nob is about three miles north of Jerusalem. It is in southern Israel. If we take a look at this map, hopefully you can see it, but I actually put this in the notes under the new links mentioned in today's videos in the description box. So if this is Jerusalem right here, we're three miles north right here in Nob. And this map actually follows... David's flight from Saul. So you can see all of the little routes he took here. So he came to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest, and Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling and said to him, so he is fearing because one, the fact that he is showing up unannounced means there's something going on. And he might be thinking that perhaps there is some sort of dissension between Saul and David. He probably looks disheveled from being on the run, secondly, but also there may have been a breach of trust, which is never anything good that's going to follow that. And David came here because this was where the tabernacle was after the destruction of Shiloh. So he says to him, why are you alone? Now, David was not only well-respected, but he was high ranking in the military. So he should not be traveling alone. He should be surrounded by a crew of men. Probably another reason why he might be a little suspicious here. And no one with you. And David said to Ahimelech the priest, well, the king has charged me with a matter. Well, that's a lie because Saul has not charged him with any kind of matter here. And he said to me, let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. Again, another lie. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. So he's basically saying, I'm on a secret mission from the king. And he's blatantly lying, of course, to be able to protect his life. And most people would probably read this and think that it's okay because he's deceiving the enemy. But sadly, we will see that this very lie ends up getting Ahimelech and 85 priests killed in the next chapter. So a little white lie can in fact turn into a huge disaster. So this shows us that we can't categorize or minimize sin because it really is all wrong in the eyes of God, regardless of the motive. So heart check. Do you excuse sin based on your idea of its seriousness? 
Verse three, now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. So he's hungry. He's been traveling and running. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there's holy bread. Now, remember, this is the show bread or the bread of the presence. And this was only to be consumed by the priests. If the young men have kept themselves from women. So he is willing to give David the holy bread, which would be a direct breach of God's law. And David answered the priest, truly women have been kept from us always. When I go on an expedition, the vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? holy. So the priest gave him the holy bread for there was no bread, but there was the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day that it is taken away. So it almost seems like there's a little bit of justification here. The fact that the bread that is going to be given to him is the one that is no longer fresh and considered holy. So this is another account where we see the spirit of the law superseding the law itself. And Jesus refers to this account in Luke 6 and Mark 2, whenever he and his disciples are chastised by the Pharisees for gathering grain to eat on the Sabbath. And even in the Talmud, which is a publication of Jewish law, it's a very expanded version of God's law, it even explains that the preservation of life trumps any other law or commandment. So in other words, love is greater than all. Now, this doesn't mean that you can do anything you want and sin in the name of love, but what it does mean is that if a commandment in the Bible is causing death of another person or causing you to hate others, then you are in the wrong. So heart check. How dogmatic or legalistic are you? Does it cause hatred within? Or are you able to understand the truth and love others through it? Verse 7, Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. Now his name means fearful, and this word chief here could mean mighty, violent, or obstinate. And we will see by his actions that he is indeed a violent and obstinate man. Then David said to Ahimelech, Then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? So he has no weapons and he believes he needs one. For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. Now, the only business that the king has is to kill David. So there is some truth here that there is some haste attached to that, but not in the way that David is talking about. And the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. So it would have been wrapped in a cloth, of course, to prevent rusting. And if you will take that, take it for there is none but that here. And David said, there is none like that give it to me. Now, when we think about what the sword represents in the Bible, it oftentimes is linked to the word of God. And we too should be people who are like, at any expense, give me the word of God. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. So he leaves Nob and travels over to Gath, which is a Philistine city, because this is right along here, along the Mediterranean coast is the area of the Philistines. Why would he go into Philistine territory? Well, it might be because Saul would be looking for him in Israel. He wouldn't think that he would go straight into enemy territory. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David is ten thousands. Now notice that they're already calling him the king. So this may have been kind of a rumor or even an exaggeration at this point. But what we see here is that it is foreshadowing of his future. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. Now, this is the background now that's being set up for Psalm 34 and Psalm 56. And he is referred to as Abimelech in Psalm 34, because Abimelech is more like a dynastic title, kind of like Pharaoh. And Psalm 56 will tell us that he's actually captured at this point, kind of held prisoner. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands, meaning even demon possessed, and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? So he's like, listen, I do not want an insane soldier. Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? He's like, I got enough crazy people here. Shall this fellow come into my house? Now, much like today, it was not customary to bring any harm against somebody who was mentally unstable. So in a way, David's kind of trying to play that card where he could claim insanity. 
Chapter 22. Now David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. So his family now coming up after him. And David was at a low at this point. You know, he has just lied his way out of imprisonment. And now the Lord is sending him to a dark and depressing cave. But this is where the Lord will often meet with us, you know, in our valleys. And Paul spoke about this in Romans 5, whenever he said that we rejoice in our suffering because it produces endurance and it builds character. If If you will seek him while you're in that dark place. But if we resist him in those times of our lives, and if we blame him and sit there and think that this is all his fault, we will also resist that opportunity to grow in those dark times. So if light is necessary for growth, he really is our only hope whenever we are depressed or down and out. He is the light that we need to be able to break ground. And David even penned in Psalms 57 and 142 while he is in this cave. And even though they are Psalms of lament, he's exalting the Lord and he is putting his trust in him. So the Lord wants us to be joyful and comfortable, but he also knows that there are necessary seasons of growth and that ain't going to happen in comfort. So he does his greatest work in the dark times. So heart check, are you able to see his light in the darkness? Are you allowing his word to take root so that he can grow you? Verse two, and everyone who was in distress and everyone who is in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him and he became commander over them and there were with him about 400 men. So we will see him refer to this in Psalm 142. Now these men we're very much so like the people who gather to Christ. You know, it is when we are in distress, when our life is in shambles, it is when we are in debt and we don't know where we're going to get our next paycheck from, or we're in a desperate situation. It is when we are discontent and we are looking for something better. A lot of times that is what will bring us to Christ. And what's really cool is that these 400 men will actually form the core of his military in the future. So the more that they hang around him, same way that the more we hang around Jesus, Jesus, they become more like him. So they start out as like this rebellious group of renegades, and they're going to eventually turn to valiant warriors. That's what Jesus does with us. He takes us from that rebellious nature to a warrior with him. So they were called and anointed just as David was. Even though he is at the helm leading them, they are just as important. Their anointing and their calling is just as important as David's is. So don't ever doubt that. You know, if you're not the one in the great position up front, your calling and your anointing back here is just as powerful and just as important to the Lord. And David went from there to Mizpah which means watchtower. This is south of the Dead Sea in Moab. So here we are in Mizpah. So he crossed all the way across this region of the wilderness, across the Dead Sea into Mizpah. Actually, he probably went around. (laughs) Why did he go to Moab? Remember, his great-grandma Ruth is a Moabite, so he has taken his parents there. And he said to the king of Moab, please let my father and mother stay with you till I know what God will do for me. And he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. So strongholds are a place of refuge. Then the prophet Gad said to David, do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So you can't stay in the place of safety. You need to go out to the place of praise, but also to the place that might be a little bit of dangerous territory, but God's going to be with you there. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Now the location of forest of Hereth is actually unknown. Verse six, now Saul heard that David was discovered and the men who were with him. Saul was sitting at Gibeah under the tamarisk tree. Of course he was on the height with his spear in his hand and all his servants or his bodyguards were standing about him. And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, hear now people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds that all of you have conspired against me? So now we're starting to see Saul's insecurities come out and he is paranoid thinking that everybody's against him. It's almost like he's got this guilty victim mentality, like everyone's attacking me. 
No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. So notice he can't even call him by name here. He's calling him the son of Jesse, not David. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. I'm like, what a whiny little baby. Then answered Doeg the Edomite who stood by the servants of Saul. Remember, he was the one who was able to witness what David had said between him and Ahimelech. I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. So what is Doeg doing here? I mean, he probably knows that if he gives Saul this information, that Saul's probably going to promote him. It's going to make him look real good. But not only that, he might be trying to deflect any anger of Saul's away from them. Then the king sent to summon Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests who were at Nob, and all of them came to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. So obviously he has a clear conscience because remember, the priest didn't know what David was doing. I mean, he was clueless. And Saul said to him, why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him so that he has risen against me to lie in wait as at this day? Then Ahimelech answered the king, and who among all your servants is so faithful as David? So notice that he is inadvertently defending David here. Who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard and honored in your house? Is today the first time that I have inquired of God for him? No, let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. So he's like, wait a minute, I didn't do anything different than I've been doing this whole time. I've been treating him the same way I would treat you with honor. And the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. And they knew that he fled and did not disclose it to me. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. So they knew better. Their fear of God was much stronger than their fear of Saul here. Then the king said to Doeg, you turn and strike the priests. And Doeg the Edomite, of course, he's savage and doesn't care, turned and struck down the priests. And he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod. So they were defenseless against him. And Nob, the city of priests, he put to the sword, both man and woman, child and infant, ox, donkey, and sheep, he put to the sword. Now, this is one of Saul's worst acts in his entire kingship. And as horrible as this is, sadly, this is a partial fulfillment of the judgment against the house of Eli. It doesn't condone or justify the actions done here, but it is fulfilling that. Verse 20, but one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. Now, this is interesting because David is the one who got them in this problem in the first place, but of course, he's the only one who's he's going to be able to find some refuge in, so he's not allowing any bitterness to hold him back from that. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. So he's admitting here, this is my fault. Stay with me. Do not be afraid for he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me, you shall be in safekeeping. So they both become enemies of Saul. Now this section here actually doesn't take place, we believe, until chapter 23. And we'll read about that in just a moment. And we'll read about that in just a moment, but it made sense to put it here to be able to complete this account. Chapter 23. Now they told David, behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah, which is an area in Judah, and they are robbing the threshing floors. So this tells us that Saul is not doing his job to protect the people in his region. And the threshing floors, if you remember, is the area where the oxen would tread upon the wheat and it would separate the wheat from the chaff. And these also acted as storage areas for the good wheat. So the Philistines are taking away their sustenance, but also their income. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord. Lord. This is very wise of him, obviously seeing that he is a man after the Lord's heart. Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord answered him. So he will confirm this message. Arise, go down to Keilah, but also give him a promise for I will give the Philistines 
Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. So God's promise fulfilled here. And when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. So remember, the ephod not only holds the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes, but it also has that little pouch for the Urim and the Thummim. And so he's going to use that now to be able to continue to inquire of the Lord. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah and Saul said, God has given him into my hand for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. All right. Now Saul is assuming that because things are going his way, that it must be God. But just because an opportunity presents itself doesn't necessarily mean that it is coming from the Lord, especially if it goes against God's will. So anytime we are faced with an opportunity, we we should always check our motives first. Now, in this case, it would be Saul's motive is to kill David, purely driven by evil and ego and pride. So we've got to do that before we assume that it is God's will. So heart check. How quickly are you to jump to the, well, it must be God conclusion. Verse 8, and Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. So notice that these questions are going to be yes and no questions because that's basically what the Urim and Thummim would be. If it came up, say red, it would be yes or black, it would be no. I'm not saying they were red and black. I'm just giving you an example. Then David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. So that was a yes. Then David and his men who were about 600 arose and departed from Keilah and they went wherever they could go. Now, I'm sure at this point, they wanted to go ahead and rise up and fight, but they didn't. This was very wise and humble of them. And when Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. And David remained in the strongholds, meaning the hiding places, in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph, which is known as a refining place. So God here turning up the heat. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. If you've been with me for a while, you know how much I love that term, but God. That's why I have that sign behind me, because when things seem impossible, we can say, but God, God is the God of the impossible. You know, if it feels like you aren't going to be able to get out of a pit, but God can get me out of this mess. If it feels like relationships aren't going to be mended, but God can reconcile anyone. Verse 15, David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose up, oh, hi, Jonathan, and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God, meaning he encouraged him at this point. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. And Saul, my father, also knows this. Now, this is one of the most beautiful parts of Jonathan and David's friendship. You know, Jonathan may have not been able to single-handedly save David, but his gift of encouragement to David was far more valuable because it ultimately strengthened David and he was able to then reject any fear that might have been coming over him. And we too have a friend like this in Jesus who tells us the same thing. You don't need to fear because we are a royal priesthood under the King of Kings and we can reject fear because there's a promise on our lives and we have a friend who is next to us who is going to be able to see that promise fulfilled. And we can reject fear because we are in a covenant of safety and protection. So heart check. Is there an area of your life where fear is taking over? Can you reject it knowing that you have a greater friend in Jesus? And not only is it important to have that friend in Jesus, but to also surround yourself with people like this, not people who are tearing you down or criticizing you or making you feel small. We should always surround ourselves with people who are going to encourage us, not tell us what we want to hear, but encourage us with truth. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. So they're renewing their covenant of friendship and protection. And David remained at Horesh and Jonathan went home. And I just love Jonathan. You know, we already see that he will 
take part in risky business if he knows that it is for the greater good. And not only that, he was content with being David's assistant. You know, when he said, I'm going to be right next to you, he's not trying to take over his power the way that Saul was always clenching at power. No, he's like, I'm going to be here to support you and lift you up. Verse 19, then the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah saying, is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horesh on the hill of Hekilah, which is south of Jeshimon? I'm like, there's always got to be a Ziphite, right? Who's going to rise up and rebel. Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. And Saul said, may you be blessed by the Lord, for you have compassion on me. And I'm like, oh, Saul, talking a big talk. You know, now he's going to talk the Jesus talk, but he obviously doesn't walk it. Go make yet more sure. Know and see the place where his foot is and who has seen him there, for it is told me that he is very cunning. So Saul really thinks that all of this is happening because David is deceitful, which he was with Ahimelech, but for the most part, this is just because God's hand is upon David's life, and Saul is rejecting that or denying it. See, therefore, and take note of all the lurking places where he hides. And why does he know where to hide? Remember, he was a shepherd. He knows this land well. And come back to me with sure information. Then I will go with you. So Saul isn't about to do the dirty work. He's going to make everybody else do it before he goes out. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. He's like, you guys do the dirty work and I'll come in and get the victory. And they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon and in the Arabah to the south of Jeshimon. And Saul and his men went to seek him, and David was told, so he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that he had pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon, Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul. And Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them. A messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. So here we see the divine protection of God upon David. He is rerouting Saul to go fight the Philistines. Therefore, that place was called the Rock of Escape. So meaning there was a memorial probably set up here. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. And En Gedi means spring of the kid. And this was literally a place where goats hung out. Chapter 24. Now, when Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all of Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goats' rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. So, if anybody ever asks you, is there people pooing in the Bible? Yes, Saul. We're just keeping it real here, folks. You know, these are very real people with real needs. Everybody does it. Now, David and his men were were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. This is no coincidence. Of course, God had them sitting in that cave for a reason. And the men of David said to him, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Okay, wait, what? He could have just taken him out right here, but he's cutting off a corner of his robe. And what is the corner of the robe? Well, if you remember that on the hem of the robe, there's that blue hemming, or there's also tassels on the corner. I remember when I used to read this, I was thinking of David literally sitting there like sawing off a corner of a robe, but I think it was a much easier just kind of... It probably didn't make that noise. And afterward, David's heart struck him. So this is his conscience now making him feel guilty for having done this because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Well, the robe was a symbol of Saul's God-given royal authority. So that is why he's feeling guilty. It has nothing to do with Saul, but more so against God. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So he feels as though he has disrespected the one who got anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. So he's protecting Saul and Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. So very different style of leadership here. Remember when Saul was supposed to completely destroy the Amalekites and he just let his men take the spoil for themselves. So he had no control over them, or at least he didn't care at that point. But David cares and he's got control over his men and also very different from Saul, who was willing to throw spears 
spears at both David and his own son. And afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my Lord, the king. So notice how he's still respecting him. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. Now, of course, this is not him worshiping him, but he is putting himself in a place of humility or in a lesser position. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? And even that, I mean, he's not coming at him with these accusations of why are you attacking me? He's putting it on his men. Like, you know what? They're the ones accusing me. Why are you listening to them? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against the Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, see the corner of your robe. And remember, he is his father-in-law because he married his daughter. And I did not kill you. You may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. But my hand shall not be against you. So he's putting it all on God at this point to be the judge. As the proverb of the ancients say, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. So he is declaring his heart righteous. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. So he's like, I'm worthless to you. Why are you coming after me? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. Now, I want to stop here for a moment because I know that we have talked in the past about not questioning people who have been put into authority. And there's truth to that. God has placed authority in our lives and we are called to be submissive to that authority, except in the case where it breaks the commandment or the laws or the morals of God. But the example that we are seeing here is that when authority is abused, it can be confronted with truth. And that's what we are seeing David do here. And this is really important to grasp because people will use the Bible and abuse the word in order to abuse authority by saying, don't question the pastor, don't question authority. And that's where you see abuse in church. And so we need to rise up against that kind of silencing of people, especially those who have been harmed in any way. If that has been you, because I have seen it, I have heard it, people coming to me with these concerns, it needs to be confronted and the Lord will strengthen you. He will be with you in it. Trust me when I tell you this, because God is the ultimate authority, not the pastors, not the church. And we don't need to be the judge and we don't need to take revenge. We can allow God to do that, but we must come out with the truth and do so with love and humility. Verse 16, as soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, is this your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and he wept. Now, this is a really beautiful example of heaping coals over your enemy's heads because David could have taken Saul out, but he didn't. He treated him with kindness instead. And this is what led to the change of heart that we're seeing in Saul. He killed his ego with kindness. And this goes against the grain of our flesh. You know, when people mistreat us, we want to lash out and we want to fight back. But if we can restrain ourselves and treat people with kindness, just watch what the Lord will do. So heart check. When you are mistreated, do you set out to kill them with a sword or to kill them with kindness? Now, even though there is remorse here, obviously it's going to be very short-lived. And so another example we are seeing here is that emotion without action will ultimately lead to even deeper rebellion and sin. Verse 17, he said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt with well with me in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. Now, I just wonder if this is actually something that he really feels in his heart. I kind of think not considering how he feels about him, but who knows. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king. So he is admitting here that David will be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. 
Now, even though he is admitting this, I don't think he likes it very much. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. So it was customary that when a new king came to the throne, that king would then go and wipe out the previous king's family because he didn't want any kind of rebellion to try to usurp the throne once again. So this explains why Saul may be saying the things that he is saying. He is trying to plead for mercy. And David swore this to Saul, and then Saul went home. But David and his men went up to the stronghold. So David is going back into hiding, which shows us that he doesn't quite trust Saul and everything that he's saying. You know, fool me once, shame on you, but fool me twice, shame on me. So he knows better. But what I love about David in these chapters is that he never caved in to that external pressure from everybody else. He didn't care what everyone else thought. He stuck to his morals. He maintained a heart of righteousness. And that is the mark of a man who is after the heart of God. Taking a look at some of our deep dive questions now, how did David's lie to protect himself turn out to be tragic? How does this make you consider unforeseen consequences when making decisions? How was Goliath's sword significant for David? Consider David's leadership style. How are these traits admirable? Is this style of leadership still effective today? How can false narratives and insecurity lead to disaster? Can you cite any modern cases of this? And consider Jonathan and David's relationship. How important is it to have friends like this? How do David and Saul's decision-making differ? Whose example do you follow? And how can we respect authority without compromising God's morals? So Heavenly Father, we thank you for showing us what a man after your heart looks like. Even in the middle of his mess-ups, David continued to show compassion and integrity in the way that he deals with Saul. So I pray that we will all be like this, where we always seek you and your guidance in everything, especially when it involves coming up against direct opposition. Help us, Lord, never to cave into our own emotion or impulse, but to maintain patience as we wait for your word. And forgive us if we have ever lied our way out of a scary situation or out of desperation. Thank you for your forgiveness and your grace in all things. I pray that we will always be truthful, even when we can't see the future consequences. So help us to trust in you, knowing that you will work all things together for good. You are the judge of all people, not us. So thank you, Lord, for reminding us that our job is to love and we can leave the judgment to you. For love covers a multitude of sins. So may that be etched on the deepest parts of our hearts. I pray that we never allow your commandments to create a hatred in our hearts in any way. And we speak against any insecurities and renounce any lies or falsehoods that are being whispered in our ears about anyone. I pray that we will not allow insecurities to bring us to a place of victimhood where we feel we are being attacked by people who are probably not even thinking about us. But if there is a legitimate attack, I pray that you will give us the strength to confront it with truth and love. We trust, Lord, that you are protecting us. And if there is anyone who is struggling today to confront abuse or anybody who worries that they may be out of line or in a weaker position, I pray that you give them the strength that they need to expose darkness, even if it means that they too are exposed in any way, but protect their hearts and their reputation. And I pray that you will not allow this kind of evil to remain uncovered. If we need to cut corners in order to prove something, give us the scissors. I pray that we will be wise in every single decision-making opportunity that we are faced with. May we not assume that everything that comes our way and works in our favor is from you, but may we seek assurance from you and trust that you will bring confirmation. We want to be faithful, but we also want to be wise. We know that you will never tempt us to do anything against your will. So may we always double check our motives and the outlook if we act upon it. And for anyone who might be in a dark place or a cave of depression today, we ask that your light will flood their souls right now. Lift the pressure that may be hovering over them. Free their body and their minds and spirits from any heaviness. I pray that they will know that they are not crushed or abandoned because you are with them. So renew their strength today as they put their hope in you. We come against any negativity that may be filling the minds of any person and ask that you help us to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. 
We know that you have a future and a hope planned for us. And this time of weakness is an opportunity for your strength to prevail. So give us the strength to move one foot in front of the other, to climb out of the pit that we might be in. Help us, Lord, to have patience in this affliction as we stay focused on you. We know that you develop us in those harder times, so we welcome you to do what you need to do. And if there are any severed relationships today, Lord, we ask for reconciliation. We don't want to put ourselves into compromised or unsafe situations, but we also don't want to hold on to any bitterness or guilt for having not tried to pursue peace. I pray that we will be wise and compassionate as David was, but never naive. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving us discernment and wisdom. We are so grateful for your presence and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna end up after I die, but I don't wanna live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're gonna say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.